welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Kristen Stilt, a professor at the at Harvard Law School and founder of the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program and also the faculty director. And I'm very happy to be co-presenting with Marjorie Montes, who is a visiting fellow at the program. And rather than give you long, a long introduction, we'd rather just jump in to the project, uh, if that's okay with you. But we're, I'm sure we'd be happy to talk to you about career paths or any of the things that you might be wanting to hear more about uh, as you, I'm sure many JDs, think about your path into the important and wonderful field of animal law. So we promised to talk to you about animal rights and rights of nature. Indeed, we are going to do that today. That's, this is a broad project that we're undertaking at the program, and we'll be launching in 2024 a new initiative on rights of nature um, that will be led by Mothrin and, our, and myself. And today we're going to focus on one article we're working on under this big umbrella of rights of nature and animal rights. And we're not presenting to you a paper you've read, but we're going to try to present to you all the elements, the crucial elements of the paper. And we really want your critical feedback as we continue to, to progress. So the working title of that article is Naturalized Animal Rights. Now, we're going to start by Maka reading to the, the introduction to the article, and then I'll come back and uh, give you the outline of the argument, and then we'll, we'll walk through it going back and forth between us. But first, just take in this, this powerful, I hope, introduction. The story of the woolly monkey who would eventually be named Estrellita likely began with wildlife traders in Ecuador, operating both in plain sight and in contravention of the country's wildlife laws. The illegal wildlife trade is like the illegal drug trade. Powerful international and national mafias request certain species to sell as pets or to collectors. The hunters, who are also called extractors, are underprivileged local residents who are paid around $10 for each poached animal. Intermediaries then smuggle the animals across the Ecuadorian border using the same routes as the illegal drug trade. Infant monkeys are sedated and stuffed into toilet paper rolls. If the animals survive, they will be sold for thousands of dollars in China, Japan, Thailand, Canada, the US, or Europe. Only one out of 10 animals survive. One day, likely around the year 2000, an individual who might have been named Jose went into the Ecuadorian Amazon to capture young animals to be sold with in Ecuador and abroad. Estrita was living with an extended community of woolly monkeys in a lowland forested region, spending most of her time in the canopies of the highest trees holding on to her mother's belly. Woolly monkeys only have one baby at a time, whom they nurse for a year. So Estrita's mother was investing all of her resources and raising her newborn baby to thrive in the Amazon forest. On this unfortunate day, Estrita was nursing while her mother ate ripe figs on a treetop, one of her favorite meals, when suddenly every woolly monkey in the community went silent and immobile, sensing the presence of hunters. Although woolly monkeys can distinguish hunters from other humans who represent no danger, such as gatherers or researchers, it was too late to avoid being seen. A hunter shot Estrita's mother dead, and Estrita fell many feet to the ground while still grasping onto her mother. Once on the ground, Estrita was ripped away from her dead mother's body and stuffed into a box with other terrified baby woolly monkeys. Some babies had fractures and gun wounds and would die shortly after. Many mothers and infants died and disappeared that day, and the whole community was deeply affected. Woolly monkeys' reproduction cycle is slow. They have one baby at a time, invest a long time in raising their offspring, and form deep emotional bonds. So encounters with hunters are devastating to them as individuals and as members of complex communities. Estrita was handed a stuffed animal or a blanket as a surrogate mother while she waited in a box or cage for someone to buy her as a pet in an Ecuadorian marketplace for around $80. Most poached infant monkeys develop psychological and physical problems like muscle atrophy, bone disease, and abnormal behavior such as rocking, self-grasping, digit sucking, and self-mutilation. 
She was quickly sold at an illegal wildlife market in the city of Ambato. It may have been a middleman who purchased her with the intent to sell her in the country or abroad. Or perhaps it was Ana Beatriz Burbano who saw her in this market and thought she could rescue her from an even worse fate. Estrellita was about one month old at that time. What we do know is that Estrellita lived with Ana Burbano and her human family, learning to drink from cups, sit on chairs, and wear clothes and diapers like a human toddler. Estrellita's captivity in Ana's home continued. The neighbors must have known about her presence, but perhaps it was common enough for individuals to keep wildlife as pets that no one objected. It was not until 18 years later that the environmental authority received an anonymous tip that a monkey was living in a private home. Perhaps the call came from a neighbor or a co-worker that had a disagreement with Anna and sought to punish her through the monkey she treated as a daughter. The authority confirmed that a woolly monkey could be seen on the terrace, so they confiscated Estrellita on September 11, 2019. The Ecuadorian Organic Code of the Environment prohibits the possession of wild animals without a license, which is not generally issued to individuals. Um, when Estrellita was confiscated, she was then put in quarantine in a local zoo. The vet report among Estrellita's arrivals stated that she had was malnourished and had several problems. For example, her teeth were worn, so she couldn't really eat solid food, which are basic in a woolly monkey's diet. Not even a month later, she died in the zoo. And she, the vet reported that she died from a cardiorespiratory arrest, which is a common problem with monkeys that, ha that have been living in captivity. Without knowing of Estrellita's death, her human family filed a habeas corpus on her behalf. The lower court and the court of appeals denied the habeas corpus. And when the human found out, uh, Ana Burbano found out that Estrellita had died, she changed her, the writ and asked to be given Estrellita's corpse back. The, this case was selected by the Constitutional Court to develop binding jurisprudence on animal rights and rights of nature, the topics that we will explain today, and we will come back to Estrellita's case later on in, in the talk. All right, thank you, Maka. Of course, that is, that is a woolly monkey. So, uh, what is our argument in the paper? So, our argument starts with the position that achieving animal rights faces many obstacles in all jurisdictions worldwide. There have been a uh, few wins. You might say Cecilia and Sandra, uh, something that um, Maka has said in great detail. We might say it was the, uh, the zoo in Islamabad. Of course, that was the writ of mandamus, not habeas corpus. But in general, we don't see a lot of traction. Perhaps in contrast, the rights of nature are spreading worldwide. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. And uh, a UN group doesn't necessarily indicate something is spreading, but it is quite interesting that there is now a UN working group on harmony with nature. So there are indeed reasons to be skeptical of rights of nature. We'll, we'll get to that in, in a little bit. There are indeed reasons to be skeptical of, of rights generally as a, uh, as a desired outcome for any, any movement. But Rights of nature can be a path to animal rights. And today we'll show us cases from Ecuador, which we've already given you a bit of, Brazil, Turkey, and Panama. There are uh, other cases that we'll have in our paper. They're a little more nuanced and complex, so we're not taking the time to present them today, but we're not, not limited to, to just these. And indeed, this was our kind of big argument here. Uh, rights of nature may be essential for making meaningful progress with animal rights. And that, our argument would say, is for several reasons or in several ways. And we'll come back in the conclusion to try to make that plain to you uh, in, a, in a stronger way. Okay. So our presentation will limit, will sort of substantiate these steps of the argument. So all of you in the room probably know this, but just as a, as a, a, a quick reminder, you know, what does animal rights mean? This is a very, uh, shorthand way of thinking about the difference between welfare uh, and rights, and that there have been few victories uh, in courts or parliaments. This, of course, is image of happy, uh, the elephant in the Bronx Zoo, which, you know, to my mind, if there were ever a case 
for uh, transferring an animal to a sanctuary, that would have been it. But of course, that's not what the New York uh, court had decided. Rights of nature uh, are spreading. You can see many countries, even states in the US, sort of a little bit tangential to what we're talking about today, but we're happy to talk about that in the question and answer. Rights of nature are spreading world, world, worldwide. Uh, the context, of course, is different. In each place, it's not, it doesn't appear in the exact same way. There's not one unified view of rights of nature, but indeed, uh, indeed they, are, they are spreading. So just to take a second to talk about what are rights of nature? So when we talk about rights of nature, especially, for example, in universities and the Western world, sometimes we talk about Christopher Stone's influential article, Can Trees Have Standing, right? But a lot of the foundation of rights of nature actually comes from indigenous worldviews, where mm, they talk about the interconnection of all living beings and living in harmony with what surrounds us. So I would like to ask you guys to, uh, with a lift of hands, if you find yourself represented in these images. Does these images in some way represent how you feel about nature, animals, our place in the world, or not? Okay. Some people find, okay. So why, why, for those of you who volunteered? Yeah, go ahead. I think it kind of centers humans as part of nature, which I think is interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, as you can see, both images are circular. Humans are not at the top of a pyramid as it usually is in our legal systems. And these images represent a sumak kausai, which is an indigenous principle. It's a proposal of a new way, political and economic, new way of living that comes from the Andean cultures in Latin America. And sumak kausai is from the Quechua, Quechua language. And the woman you see over there is Pachamama. And as you can see, she is holding all of nature, including animals and natural elements within her arms. And an interesting part of this image, as you can see, is that on the outer side, we see humans holding hands, different uh, cultures. But over here, we see a dog in the image. So we see that humans aren't separated from the rest of nature. And even though these images represent a specific indigenous worldview coming from the Andean, um, Andean cultures, you will see in some of our cases that judges from other countries kind of it use these cases as an example of a new way of protecting the environment and use this way of thinking as something that they also bring into their countries and to their legal system, even though they belong to different countries. So these topics of interconnection and harmony, we can see that are transversal uh, throughout these cases. Great. And some of the places where you may have heard about uh, rights of nature taking root, uh, rivers being granted to legal personhood in uh, Aotearoa or New Zealand as part of attempts by the New Zealand government to restore uh, and repair the terrible damages that were done to the indigenous population, in particular with regard to the natural, uh, natural resources and uh, bodies of water. So there are several rivers now that have been granted personhood, which is Related but not exactly the same as rights of nature, but but uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand is often included in the rights of nature movement. And then uh, a case that precedes Estrelitz's case in Ecuador, where the Los Angeles Forest was declared to have uh, its own rights as its own ecosystem. So those are just a few to show some of the diversities. And as you might be thinking, there are a lot of there is a lot of criticism uh, regarding the rights of nature as a theory, as a concept. All of these are examples of articles that, that criticize the rights of nature and we are well aware, even as you can see Kristen is up there, she has an article that mentions a lot of this criticism. For example, it's common to see, well, what is this? What are you talking about? What is nature? It's such a vague and coherent concept, like how do we limit nature? 
is that nature outside this window? Is that tree nature? Is just the Amazon or these pristine places nature? And then all the arguments against where we are kind of thinking binary between nature and culture, you know? A other criticism is how do we implement this? It's very hard to implement because we can't really delimit nature. A other problems with the, con the concept that scholars mention is that um, it doesn't really tell people how they should uh, behave and comply with these laws on the rights of nature. So okay, we recognize that nature has rights. Okay, what does that mean for us as citizens? How should we act? Other criticism is that when we talk about rights of nature, we're usually talking that there should be guardians that would represent and protect nature, but this can also lead to bias of these guardians. Like, who should we name guardians? And then why? Why should we allow certain groups to have these interests protected? Another common criticism is that nature really can't have rights. Like, nature cannot be held liable, cannot be responsible, and so it cannot have personhood or rights. And then we have other types of criticism from even from the indigenous uh, movement where they say we shouldn't be giving nature rights, we should actually be giving indigenous peoples the, um, the faculty to protect all these areas and the, pro the property over their territories to protect nature. So there is a lot of criticism that we are well aware of um, and Kristen is well aware of and kind of summarized in her article. But nevertheless, we forge on <laughs> with this presentation. Yes. So today we're going to talk about four cases from Ecuador, Brazil, Turkey, and Panama. All right. So back to Ecuador first. You already heard uh, a fair amount about the Estrelita case. We're starting with Ecuador not because it's chronologically uh, appropriate, but because it's intellectually appropriate in the sense of a real clear foundation. Because Ecuador has the advantage of having rights of nature in the Constitution. So it was a pretty straightforward move, not an easy one by any means, but a straightforward move to go from rights of nature to animal rights in, the, in Estrelita's decision. And so just to so you see what the constitutional language looks like, uh, the two key articles are 10 and 71. Individuals, communities, towns, nationalities, and groups are owners and will enjoy rights guaranteed in the Constitution and international instruments, but the important one for us, nature will be subject to those rights recognized by the Constitution. And then over in Article 71, we have sort of the substance and then the process. Nature, or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and occurs, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles, structure, functions, and evolutionary processes. And then this one is this very broad standing uh, provision. All persons, communities, peoples, and nations can call upon public authorities to enforce the rights of nature, to enforce and interpret these rights. The principles set forth in the Constitution shall be observed as appropriate. The state shall give incentives to natural persons and legal entities and to communities to protect nature and to promote respect for all the elements comprising an ecosystem. And if you're thinking, how in the world is that going to happen? That's, of course, a very, a very, um, a very reasonable question to have, uh, to have in your mind as we go on. So uh, Estrelita's case, as Maka said, despite the fact that uh, the habeas issue was essentially moot, because she had, as they say, had died in the zoo. Uh, and uh, other reasons why it wouldn't be the most auspicious case, one might think, the constitutional courts uh, took it to answer three, these three questions. Subject of rights, the scope of the writ, and then can non-human animals be considered as subject of rights protected by the rights of nature? And that third one is really what we're getting at today, right? And so we uh, first entered into this, this, this topic by working on an amicus brief with the NHRP. And you can imagine how we answer those questions. <laughs> um, yes, animals are subject of rights. Yes, habeas corpus can be appropriate. And yes, animals are subject of rights protected by the rights of nature. But we wanted to be very sure to get this really important point in. Uh, first, that there should be some kind of implementation that there should be protocols to guarantee the rights of the animals. And then this other, uh, other point, which really hits at, the, hits at the distinction sometimes made between environmental and animal law. 
we were concerned that the court might say, yes, a uh, species, a species has rights under the rights of nature. And that wasn't the outcome we were looking for. We wanted there to be recognition that an individual animal uh, has a right under the rights of nature. And so we posed to the court, how many animals should be needed? One, two, ten. Is this even a helpful question to ask? And Maka made the really powerful argument that you know, even in animals uh, who are not endangered, like if you take the woolly monkey, for example, with the reproductive uh, systems and the intense dedication to one animal for one year, that we wanted to argue, don't ask this question. Just allow an individual animal to be granted the rights of nature. And in, it rights under the rights of nature. And indeed, that's what happened. It was a 72 decision. And here's how they answered our, the question. All animals are recognized as subject of rights. They make a nod towards sentience, but it's not clear that that is the reason necessarily for animals to have rights. And then the court emphasized rights of wild animals since Estralita indeed was a wild animal. But the decision uh, can be read very clearly as speaking on behalf of all animals. It dismissed the habeas corpus claim, but said it could be appropriate depending on the case. And then what we were very much hoping for was the statement that individual animals are protected, and then animals have constitutional rights through the rights of nature. So essentially, the animals are elevated to the constitutional level through Article 71. And then uh, we were really quite pleased to see this language here at the bottom protecting only the species of animals, neglecting the protection of individual animals, which in turn make up the species, endangers a significant number of animals and fuels the idea of the possibility of extinction. Even in the case of animals whose species is not endangered, neglecting or failing to protect individuals also has an impact. And the court uh, cited our, our briefs and that is almost exactly our language. Um, so that was, that was uh, very, we're very happy that was that's how the decision was made. And that gives you one very core example as we move forward now to more, more to messier situations, more complex situations of how animal rights can achieve the, um, uh, can be achieved through the rights of nature. Okay, so now we go on to Brazil. So let's talk about a case in Brazil, but first let's read the article in the Constitution that protects the environment, which is 225. All have the right to an ecologically balanced environment, which is an asset of common use and essential to a healthy quality of life, and both the government and the community shall have the duty to defend and preserve it for present and future generations. So in Brazil, there's a case called the Wild Parrot Case from 2018. What happened? In this case, there was a wild parrot, parrot living with a human family for 23 years. And the environmental authority, IBAMA, confiscated the animal, but uh, they didn't have a clear place for the animal, so they gave the human family temporary custody, but they told it, we're going to take the, the parrot away, but in the meantime, you can ha keep the, this parrot until we move the, him to a zoo or someplace else. So the family filed an action against Obama to recover the animal and to get a permanent custody. And so this case reached the Superior Court of Justice. The court partially overturned the lower court and removed the fine against the, the family and granted definite custody of the parrot, saying that separating the parrot from the family would cause more harm to the parrot because and the animal had lived 23 years with this family and couldn't survive in the wild and would be depressed in a zoo or in some other place. So in this case, there are three important arguments that the court makes. It's important to remember that the, Brazil, the Constitution of Brazil does not have rights of nature recognized as in the case of Ecuador. So judges have to use other types of arguments to get to the rights of nature and to animal rights. So in this case, First, the court starts talking about dignity. In the Brazil Constitution, dignity is one of the basic principles of the Brazilian legal system, and it appears in Article 1, human dignity. But in this case, the court criticizes the, the traditional Kantian individualistic and anthropocentric concept of dignity, saying that this has only led to the devastation of nature and animals, and saying that 
dignity should be interpreted in an ecological way. And what does this mean? It means that now human dignity should be interpreted as that not only human life matters, but other forms of life matter too. And so the court gives a importance to environmental protection, indicating that this shows that uh, we have moved and advanced as a society and that we, uh, the Brazilian uh, legal system cares not only about human life, but other forms of life. After this, the court jumps and cites the constitution of Ecuador and Bolivia. And so here we have to remember what I talked about when I spoke about those indigenous worldview images. Because the, Brazil um, cites these con constitutions that talk about Pachamama, that talk about Suma Causai in a country where those ideas aren't their own, but cites, cites them as examples of new ways of thinking of, our, of environmental protection and kind of makes the, in, in these concepts their own. And then the court says that that vision of nature, this vision of Ecuador and Bolivia, leads to recognizing that in the environment, that nature and animals have an intrinsic value. So then again, tying it with the concept of dignity. So they, they deserve respect and care, and therefore the law recognizes that they have rights and dignity. So in summary, in the case of Brazil, we have this reasoning. They start with the ecological understanding of dignity, criticizing the traditional human dignity concept, they tie this with the, their, the protection that their constitution affords to the environment in Article 2025, and taking from the Ecuadorian and Bolivian experience and their view on nature, they conclude that dignity rec um, includes the intrinsic value of animals and therefore recognizes that animals have rights. Kind of complicated uh, reasoning, but that's uh, essentially how they reach the point to recognize that animals and nature have rights. Okay, so now we move to, uh, to Turkey, and it's really, really one of the questions for us is, uh, as, we, as we think about this project, is are we speaking about a, a regional phenomenon, or is it one that might move into other parts of the world uh, beyond perhaps the, the, central, the central areas where we see the constitutional language in Ecuador, and, and the, surround, the surrounding countries or countries in the region. And so this case from Turkey is really quite important, I think, for showing the potential for, for movement. And the Constitution, like many, even though of course not the United States, but like many constitutions in the world, provides for the right to live in a healthy, balanced environment. And of course that is considered, uh, considered a human right. I just say we have US states that have that, but not, the, of course, the, the federal constitution. All right, so given that is the language that the court had to work with, I should say we're waiting for the unofficial translation, but I feel pretty confident in what, in what we have here. Um, but uh, the, the, the case was an animal protection case. So the question that the constitutional court had to evaluate was the constitutionality of Article 28A of the animal protection law that established that animal cruelty investigations are subject to a written application to the Chief Public Prosecutor's Office by the Provincial District of Directorates of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. And essentially what that did was it made it more difficult to lodge an animal cruelty investigation. Instead of going directly to, uh, to the public prosecutor, one had to go through the, through the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. And the court considered the article constitutional. But the dissent has some very interesting language, and dissents are, as you know, often relevant as a way of picking up ideas and perhaps moving into the majority later on. <laughs> so it was a dissent by one judge, it was the chief judge. And so look at what the judge, judge does here. So recognizes first that animals are part of the right to live in a healthy and balanced environment. So the effect of protection of the right of individuals to live in a healthy and balanced environment requires the protection of animals. Animals are indeed mandatory elements of a healthy and balanced environment. Like we live among them and they live among us. And an environment where animals are not protected cannot be described as healthy and balanced. If you have animals who are subject to you know, um, uh, overuse of antibiotics or other 
forms of disease or being maltreated on the street. It's not a healthy environment. Then the court notes, cites Estrelita, notes that the Ecuadorian Constitutional Court recognized that animal rights are protected by the rights of nature in the Estrelita case. That's, I think, just such an amazing, that just, we were so excited by that. And they cited our translation too. So, so you imagine some judge and, and a judge, uh, clerk is sitting in Turkey looking for rights of nature cases to see and finds the translation we made of the Ecuadorian case. So cites that, but of course can't use it directly because, well, it's not, it's not the, that jurisdiction, but moreover, Turkey doesn't have rights of nature in the Constitution, but then moves on to say, we get there anyway. So the Constitution guarantees the protection of the natural environment. This indirectly indicates the existence of an environmental right. So, of course, there's a big uh, theoretical discussion between uh, protection and rights. Apparently, the judge is engaging in that without actually putting it uh, in, in the, the dissent. Therefore, animals and their rights should be protected. So this case is really interesting to see how we get to a recognition of animal rights from only really a healthy and balanced environment. But I think this, for this judge, who we, who we hope to talk to soon, this somehow was a key, a key point in the logic. And uh, I look forward to being able to say, to say more about how the judge thought about using that to leap on to, <coughs> to the finding. All right, and now the four-step reasoning, I think I just, pretty much gave it to you, but humans have this right, animals are part of the environment, a healthy and balanced environment requires protecting animals, so they too are healthy, and then there's, we get to uh, protecting animals and their rights through the environment. All right, so our last example is, uh, is Panama. So the, the example of Panama is a bit different because the other were judicial cases, now in Panama, we have some laws. So in 2022, uh, there was a law that recognized the rights of nature. It was passed, Article 1 says, this law aims to recognize nature as a subject of rights, as well as the obligations that the state and all people have, whether natural or legal, to ensure the respect and protection of these rights. And this law in 2022 then triggered this law. This is a law from this year, which establishes the conservation and protection of marine turtles and their habitats in Panama. And this law recognizes the rights of marine turtles. <coughs> but it's very interesting because first, the law starts by saying in Article 2 that protecting marine turtles and their conservation is essential to guarantee the right to a healthy environment for all the people in Panama. And in this sense, it's kind of the same argument that we just saw in the Turkey case, where the judge is saying, hey, we can't have a right to a healthy environment if animals aren't protected. And this links to this concept of interconnection that we talked about at the beginning. But if you keep reading this law, you'll, you'll reach Article 29, which recognizes the rights of marine turtles. The, this article says, um, the state will guarantee that natural legal persons protect the rights of marine turtles and their habitats, such as living and having free passage in a healthy environment of pollution and other anthropocentric impacts that cause physical and health damage, such as climate change, pollution, bycatch, coastal development, and unregulated tourists, among others. So this, the same law recognizes that humans have the right to live in a healthy environment, and, and that marine turtles have the same right. So um, <clears throat> we start off in Panama with a law that recognizes the rights of nature, and then this triggers people to start lobbying for a right to protect marine um, marine turtles. This comes from a, war, a marine biologist that was working with a local community to try to protect marine turtles. And then we get this law where we see for the first time a, in, in a law around the world that animals like marine turtles have the right to live in a healthy environment. Okay, so we are um, exactly where we wanted to be at Tentil. Lots of time for your questions and discussion. So these are the conclusions that we are, um, you know, playing around with, thinking about for for the article. Uh, some are not controversial. I think we'll be, we've proven them to you. Some will be, you might say, is more of a stretch. You may say, blah, to the whole thing. We'll wait and hear from you in, in a minute. 
But this is the, these are the conclusions that we think we can take away. So animal rights can be achieved through rights of nature. Okay? We know that from Estralita. But that can happen even when rights of nature doesn't appear in the Constitution or existing law. Right? We can, you can even get there without that language. This is probably a little more controversial. Animal rights can be achieved through rights of nature more successfully than without a rights of nature con context. Now, I'll have to do more empirical work to probably prove that to you, or maybe you'll think, oh, yeah, like instinctively, I'm already starting to think that that's probably true. We have some ideas as to why that might be the case, but it seems like from what, from what we've looked at, the rights of nature sort of paves the way to get into animal rights perhaps a little more easily than going for a straightforward uh, animal rights angle, for which we don't really have that many case laws to, to look at. So rights of nature can have a mainstreaming effect, paving the way for a potentially wider acceptance of animal rights, perhaps because once you maybe are comfortable with rights of nature, giving rights to a non-human entity might then make it more obvious that animals should be uh, included or talking about animal rights is not so uh, extreme or such a leap from where you are if you accept rights in nature. Um, and then this one is the reason why we're starting our initiative, which is that animal rights advocates, animal protection advocates, we can talk about, talk about those distinctions if you want, uh, need, uh, sorry my typo, uh, need to engage in the rights of nature movement and think about strategies within this movement too. So we presented you a very small slice of the rights of nature movement. There's so much going on in this area. Rivers, indigenous customs, I mean, there, it's, a, it's a pretty large movement. And this is just one little piece of it, but a piece that could easily be overlooked. Uh, there will be times when a rights of a river, as I talked about in my article, river and the rights of fish may not be the same thing. And so having someone at the table, so to speak, who has the animal angle, we think is really crucial as these cases develop. And you know, just as an example, the number of times, even in the last month, Maka has been on webinars, um, conferences, come talk to this, uh, you know, about the rights of nature. It's just, it's, it's, ma it's massive. And we think that this will pass us by as an opportunity, and moreover, I would argue we should not be hostile to it. Even though it's messy, it's mushy, it's maybe conceptually problematic, the train has left the station, and if we don't get with the plan and get our voices in it, we may lose important opportunities. So, last, last word to you. Um, just to add, regarding the last point that Kristen is mentioning, just imagine uh, when the Constitutional Court in Ecuador asks, like, okay, so one of the, the, the third question is, like, can animals be protected through the rights of nature if, like, animal rights activists would answer no? And that's it, you know? That's the amicus. No, they can't. Okay, then we'll keep on protecting just species. You know, it's kind of like we are, in a way, forced to enter this movement because if we don't, it's gonna continue. It's gonna continue as it has been until now, which is only protecting species and overlooking individuals. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your attention.